we're up to our last plenary speaker, last keynote talk. So if you all want to sit down and we can get the show started. Um, Kelly wants to have just a minute to make a little announcement, so without further ado. Yeah, it's for, for people who are, that were here on the first day, we had promised that Stefan Dion would be speaking to us. And unfortunately, he didn't speak with us, as, as you know. Um, so um, we had one of our board members that was very upset about this and contacted his office and found out that there was a mix-up with his office and, of course, he did not show up. So now Stefan Dion is terribly upset about this. Um, and sends his, his um, deepest apologies. However, for anyone who's um, organizing the next um, NABIC, um, we probably have a speaker already. So um, he sound, sounds like um, um, Eleni and Stefan will try to arrange a follow-up um, session at some point. So um, that's the good news. That's my announcement. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just do a five minute quick introduction of Roberto Cagarella. So one of the really, really great things about organizing this conference is that basically you get to pick the people who you want to see and who you want to hear. And of course, you know, I mean, of course we, you know, we, we reflect carefully on people's suggestions. So for example, you know, we, we carefully reflected on Carl's 73 suggestions of speakers. Uh, I'm not far off, I'm not far off, and you know, I don't mean it as a criticism, I mean we do like a lot of suggestions. Uh, but I was particularly keen to have Roberto involved in this event. Um, about 10 years ago, I, uh, which was actually the Bien Congress in Barcelona that David organized, I, you know, at that time I started to get more and more involved with people in the Spanish speaking world. And I kept coming across this name, Roberto Gargarella, and at that time I had no idea who he was. You know, Gargahu, Gargahu, I have no idea. Isn't that the guy, you know, Gargarella, isn't that uh, the, the bad um, magician who, you know, tries to capture the Smurfs and feed them to the cats all the time? But no, it turned out to be a different guy. Uh, and as, as I became, you know, more aware of Roberto's work, you know, people kept giving me little piles of paper to read, you know, like that time reading. I realized that really, in the Spanish-speaking world, he's an absolute superstar. So when you talk about social rights, economic rights, when you talk about constitutional theory, deliberative democracy, Roberto is a bit like Ozzy Osbourne, you know, in the sense that the new, the new bands now Every time you can see the influence of Ozzy Osbourne, well, the people working in these areas now, it's very obvious that Roberto is there. Either he's actually physically there, I don't know how he does that, he really seems to be in several places at the same time, <laughs> or everyone keeps referring to his work, it's, it's really, really incredible. So, and then much to my surprise, he actually did some work on this kingdom as well. And one of the best pieces of work, or the one that I really read, that I thought was amazing, is in Rubens' edited volume here on citizens' income and welfare regimes in Latin America. And I, I really recommend everyone to have a look at this piece. And have a look at the whole book, actually. I mean, the book is really, really amazing. Is Ruben here? Yes. So you owe me some money, right? <laughs> 20 bucks will do. Uh, so when the conference came up, I, I was really, really very keen to get Roberto involved and, and was extremely pleased that Roberto accepted this talk. And, and I should say that he has just spent a lot of time in Europe, he just came back to Argentina to a massive amount of appointments and schedules and he still found time to literally fly in yesterday, come here to give a talk and he's going to have to fly out immediately to a further appointment. So, I am extremely, extremely pleased that he can literally squeeze this in. I mean, that's, that's really, really amazing. So, um, the official bio <laughs> is that Professor Roberto Garbarella is Professor of Constitutional Theory and Political Philosophy at the Universidad of Buenos Aires. He has published widely in legal political philosophy, social rights, economic rights, American constitutionalism, huge amount of work. 
I just wanted to point out the two important recent books are The Legal Foundations of Inequality, Constitutionalism in America from 2010, and then the very recent one, Latin American Constitutionalism, The Engine Room of the Constitution. And I think we're going to hear several of these themes today. So without further ado, Roberto. in uh, the political life. 
uh, writings about agrarian reform and uh, agrarian justice in the case of Thomas Paine. Paine, as you know, is one of the, the first uh, really radical thinking about uh, uh, what we uh, presently call a basic income. So, so it's a very important antecedent in, in the fight, in the dispute for uh, economic equality. Now, in this uh, lesson was also learned in, in Latin America where uh, Republicans in the 1850s also became very bold in uh, so became very bold in uh, constitutional issues and, and care very much about the import, I mean, the, about the economic equality. So let, let, let me mention a few uh, important expressions of this. Uh, one coming from who uh, some, uh, someone who was the president of the, the Mexican Constitutional Convention in 1857, and, and this was Bociano Arriaga. Bociano Arriaga said that uh, if we are going to think about the Constitution, the first thing we need to do is to, uh, to think about the distribution of land and how to ensure the basic subsistence for all. So, so from the very beginning in Latin America, uh, uh, at least from the Republican camp, which I would say uh, uh, was very important at the time, but became uh, uh, less and less relevant with the passing of time, uh, it was clear that in order to participate fully in politics, you had to have some subsistent uh, rights. Uh, I would say that there were at least two uh, expressions of, of this uh, concern. One was, I would call, uh, an extra constitutional concern, so you need to reform the, the, the economy in order to make the constitution stable. So in order to, to, to have a constitution, you need to have an a, a economic equality. So this was, Bociano uh, Arriaga uh, says, I, I say in Spanish, but the, his idea was, uh, la constitución es la ley de la tierra, meaning that if we care about the constitution, the first thing we need to care about is how we, we distribute property. Another colleague of him, uh, Ignacio Ramirez, he, he went further than that, and he said, I mean, he proposed, and this was absolutely uh, surprising in, in, for, for Latin American constitutional discussions, he, he proposed a basic income in the, in the Mexican Constitutional Convention of 1850, so we are talking about the funding period, funding period of, of Latin America, and very early, some important uh, figures in, in these uh, discussions were already proposing the, uh, a basic income. So, in the history of Latin America, uh, it was a central concern at, cert at a certain point of time the, the need of establishing a, a basic income and to, co to commit the Constitution to something like a basic income. Now, um, people like, and this is the last example I, 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 I give about the, this early period from the Republican camp, Murillo Toro, who was, Murillo Toro was, became uh, the president of Colombia at one point, and Murillo Toro also uh, was deeply involved in, in the constitutional creation and constitutional discussions, and he was actually the, the, the main responsible for Colombia adopting a universal suffrage. After the first election, his group, which was uh, um, a liberal radical group, uh, was defeated in the elections, and all his colleagues say, well, you see that you were right, you, you were not right, we, we lost the elections, people are not prepared for politics, so we, we have to give up with this fight for universal suffrage. And, and he said, and this is, I, I take as a very important uh, um, expression in early Latin American constitutional history, he said, no, the mistake was not to fight for universal suffrage, but not to be fighting at the same time for economic reform. So we need economic equality for political equality. So those of us who care about basic constitutional issues, we need to ensure for all this basic right of subsistence. So, so this discussion was very important in the funding period, both, I would say, in the United States and in Latin America. Now, and, and uh, concluding the, the first part of the, of the three parts I want to present, uh, what I would say is that the Republican view was defeated both in uh, the United States and in Latin America. So the main constitutions that we adopt in, 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 Amer in the Americas were constitutions where the social question was left outside, was left behind. So the constitutions did not take care about 
is concerned about social equality. And so they, they became constitutions that reacted against those Republican concerns. So, so uh, in Latin America, for example, what we have is uh, liberal conservative constitutions. In the United States, what you got were constitutions uh, that also, a constitution that also defeated what was seen as the, the most progressive version of the anti-federalist project. And, and in both cases, in, in the case of Latin America, in the case of the United States, we got constitutions that are all characterized by uh, their counter-majoritarian features. So expressing in uh, um, a strong judiciary, a very strong president, in the case of Latin America, an extremely strong president. And, and that basic structure, although it changed, and I will say something about these changes, is very important to keep in mind because it uh, deeply influenced the history of our countries till uh, present. So we still have, and, and this is a first important message for me, I mean a first important lesson that I learned, is that we still have constitutions that in the basic structure um, uh, are first leaving behind the, social con the concern for the social question and organizing, remember the two parts of the constitution, organizing a structure of power which is very much characterized by these counter-majoritarian elements, by this political elitism, by this, uh, I would say, burning the bridges between representatives and the people. So, so uh, uh, we can go country by country, detail by detail, uh, period by period, region by region, and I, I think it's, it's uh, I would say, quite easy to, to defend this viewpoint. So, so the basic structure of our constitutions in the Americas are constitutions <clears throat> that were organized, created after a very strong dispute between, say, liberal conservatives and Republicans, where Republicans were deeply concerned about the social question, and many of them in Latin America particularly, but also in, in the case of the Anglo-American world, they, they were very much concerned about establishing something like a basic income, so connecting, making a connection, strong connection between the Constitution and basic income, but that was a pro that project was defeated, and, and that's so a, a first important thing to say about the creation of our constitutions in the Americas. So, so, so that, that's about the first part. What, one is additional thing. Uh, I think that good constitutional law is, is normally expressed by uh, constitutional activists thinking about what's the main drama faced by our societies. For, for the Republican camp, it was clear that the main drama, the main tragedy of our societies, particularly in Latin America, but not only in Latin America, was the drama of inequality. So the idea was for them how to use all the constitutional energies in order to overcome inequality, this profound inequality. So the idea is not that we are going to uh, uh, overcome inequality through constitutional reforms or through constitutional creation, but the idea was that the constitution was a crucial step in the creation of more egalitarian societies. That project was defeated. For, for liberal conservatives like uh, Madison, the, the, the main drama, the main tragedy was another. And I would say that this was an, an acceptable understanding of the political life of the time, but was a very different understanding. So for, for Madison, the main concern was the concern about factions. So the concern about majoritarian excesses. So that's why, that explained in, in a, a for me in a clear way, and that's also happens in Latin America, why they use clearly Madison in the United States, but say Juan Bautista Alberti in, in Argentina and many others, use their constitutional energies in order to fight a different fight, which was the fight against majoritarian excesses. So they prepare a constitution. We, we have constitutions that in a way are very well prepared to resist majoritarian collective action. So, so those were two very different projects, and the one that uh, uh, became prevalent was this uh, liberal conservative project. Now, uh, this was also expressed and, uh, by, by, by an institutional system characterized by a strong presidentialism, by a uh, distrust about majoritarian capacities of participating in politics, etc. But, but all those concerns which may have been important at the time were also concerns that were very problematic from the 
Republican side, and particularly for those concerned about something like the basic income. So let, let me go to the to the, the the second period of Latin American constitutionalism, uh, and, and here it, it plays a central role: the Mexican Revolution, which comes together with the Russian Revolution. But, but in the American, this is a, a incredibly crucial event. So the coming of the Mexican Constitution, and, and that changed completely the subject, but changes in a, in a peculiar way. So let, let me say something about this second period. Um, in this second period, something very important happens at the constitutional level, but happens particularly in the area of rights. So remember what I said at the beginning. Constitutions are basically organized in two parts, one related to the organization of powers, one related to the organization of rights. What happened in the first period was extremely relevant, particularly in the organization of powers. It was created against the Republican project, a constitutional structure which was, for good and bad reasons, characterized by these counter-majoritarian elements, a very much concentrated authority, so that, what I would say, concentration of power, which in Latin America particularly was an extreme concentration of power. So that's what we got from the first period of constitutionalism. Now we are in the second. The changes that are now going to come are not changes that are going to touch on the organization of power, are changes that are going to affect the other side of the constitution, so the organization of rights. This is very important, but at the same time very incomplete, and say something about the nature of the project and the scope to, of the project and the, pro and the possibilities of the project to become successful. So in this period, after things like the Mexican Revolution, and the Mexican Revolution did not come from nowhere, it came from a profound social crisis derived from how society was organized in the previous century. So it was a social explosion. But it, what, what happened in Mexico was, in, in, on the one hand, extraordinary. So the, the, it, was, it was what we can call a, a, a revolution with, with a, a, a capital letter. Uh, but at the same time, was very limited what it achieved. What, I mean, it was both extraordinary and very limited what it achieved in terms of uh, constitutional reform. So the, all the changes, as I said, came through the area of rights. This is one example of it. So Article 27, and, and then the second is Article 123. These two articles in particular were like introducing a full uh, labor code inside the Constitution. So in one way, it was extraordinary. And for Latin America, this was the say, great lesson of Latin American constitutions to the world. This was the first constitution in the world, including social rights, and it did in a spectacular way. So it included basically everything, every right you may imagine, or almost every right you may imagine, it was here in basically these two articles. Articles that care about the uh, right of the children, right of women, right of the workers, etc. But now, at the same time, this was spectacular, and this was something that also took place in many other Latin American countries, almost, not, not immediately, but in the mid-20th mid centuries. So this was extremely important in Latin America and in the world later on. But it was, as I said, a reform that, first of all, only touched the organization of rights, and then it was a reform that was uh, created assuming, uh, assuming and touched the organization of power as it was. So the constitutional reform now was very important for what, what it did, but also because of what it preserved. If, if you take, for example, what the president of Mexico said at that time, it was very clear. We are going to accept all the rights you want, but we are going to keep the organization of power as it was before. So that was extremely important. Many people see this example as a revolutionary example, as a revolutionary constitutional example, but it's also a very limited example of what the what the revolution achieved. So uh, this is not only a, a, a consequence that affect Latin American constitution. This is a, express a way of thinking about uh, constitutional reform. Take, for example, the case of Canada and the, and the Charter of Rights in 1982. 
what the charter did for Canada is what this social rights did for Latin America. So, just, I mean, uh, given that I don't have so much time, but let, let me say a few of the things that these changes imply. These changes were extremely important, as I would say immediately, it's much better to have social commitments in the Constitution than not having them. But first, this has nothing to do with what was the commitment of the early radical republicans in the 19th century. The re early radical republicans, as we said, they wanted something different. They addressed the social question, but they, they addressed it in a very different way. Many of them, they, they were not, that was not the rule, but many of them uh, wanted a, something like a basic income in the Constitution. Many of them said the only way to take the constitutional reform seriously is to accompany the constitutional reform, the political reform with an economic reform, with a radical egalitarian economic reform. That discourse was not here anymore. So here was a, an incredibly important event that was followed in all the world, but was also a very limited one. And, and one consequence which this implied, when you put all the energy in the organization of rights, what you have, and, and this is also what you have here in Canada after the Charter of Rights, if you, if what you do is you empower the judiciary. So one of the institutions that the radical republicans most distrusted, and distrusted for good reasons, are empowered by the presence of this right. Another second important consequence, which again, I mean, that doesn't say, I, I don't want to say things against this inclusion, I want to favor this inclusion, but I also want to highlight the, the limits of this inclusion, is that you make collective claims, individual claims, individual claims that go to the judiciary. That's interesting if the alternative, if the alternative is nothing, that's interesting if you compare, for example, this constitution with the US constitution, which includes no social commitments at all. It's very important if you compare with the US constitution that is only a negative constitution. So, Latin American constitution, or say, the Charter of Rights in Canada, are extremely important when you compare with a very liberal conservative constitution like the US constitution, which has no social commitment at all, not at least not clearly explicit. But at the same time, it's very important to, to, to recognize the limits of this project and how this project is very different from what Republicans wanted in the 19th century. How this way of thinking about the social question made a collective claim, individual claim, that goes to the judiciary, which is also <coughs> very problematic and in part explain why in all the world, after committing the Constitution to this social rights, these social rights remain uh, uh, like sleeping clauses, dormant clauses. So during, during not, 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 not yet, not, not still, but during at least 50 years, in most countries, these clauses became dormant clauses. And this may be explained for different reasons, but one reason is institutional reason, which is the limits of this institutional creation. So let me go to the, to the final wave of reform, and, and, and then I, I conclude with some uh, uh, final thoughts. In the part of the final, few final years of the 20th century in uh, Latin America, particularly, we, we have a new wave of reform. So, for example, I mean, mainly those that took place in Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, etc. There were <coughs> many things that these uh, late constitutions address, uh, and, and I would mention at least two problems that were very important, and they were these constitutions were trying to address. One was the massive human rights violations that took place in the region in the, in the 70s, but that, I mean, accompanied a concern with human rights that appear all across the world. And the second was to address the consequences, the world consequences of neoliberalism. So typically, constitutions like the Venezuelan, Bolivian, Ecuadorian constitution wanted to react against the, the worst consequences of uh, economic and uh, uh, neoliberal economic reforms. So, a, a, a few things that I learned from, from this uh, constitutional reform. Well, one is that they say the globalization of the human rights question um, tends to be very important everywhere and also in the Americas. Uh, so, many judges for the first time began to recognize that this social rights, economic rights that were already incorporated in the Constitution had something, had a role to play. So 
became more and more important to enforce social rights after these two crises, this humanitarian crisis and this economic crisis. So again, the fact that these rights, these social economic rights were present in the constitutions, that was very important and actually played an important role and, and is relevant and say something, but also we should never forget about the, the limits of that project and how different that project was from what early Republicans wanted. So, so one first lesson of this final period is that uh, the choice of including economic social rights in the Constitution, I would say, was not a bad choice, but was a very limited choice, and also, I would say, a very problematic choice. Basically, why, and I think this is the last comment about this period, if what the, the constitutions of Ecuador, Venezuela, or Bolivia show us, which is that uh, for, for many people, and I assume many people in the world, and maybe people in this room, these new constitutions, like the Venezuela, Bolivia, etc., are revolutionary constitutions. Well, they, that's far from being true. Those constitutions, it's true that they did something very important, which is they expanded the list of rights that was already very long. But they, and, and, but they wouldn't complain about that. They took care, for example, and, and this is also something that maybe happened here, about multicultural rights, indigenous rights, gender rights that were not being addressed before. So I would say, fine, that's totally fine, but again, that's very limited. These projects did what the Mexican constitution did, I mean, expanded our commitment to social, multicultural, indigenous, economic, social rights, and that's totally fine, but they kept the organization of power intact. As I say in the book, uh, uh, it's like the engine room of the constitution, so the organization of power remained intact. A, a short story about that, and uh, before concluding, uh, uh, in, uh, I was in Ecuador in, the, in the 2008 with, with the discussion of the constitutional reform. I was invited like a, an expert in participation, etc. And, and uh, I was presented what they were going to introduce in the constitution in terms of participatory clauses. This was spectacular. And, and those things, they are already incorporated in the constitution. That's spectacular in a way. So I have never seen so many clauses promoting participatory clauses uh, uh, life like those clauses. So when I saw that was spectacular, but the main question for me, and this is something that, uh, I mean, was a real disappointment for them, uh, I asked, well, this is spectacular, but what we are going to do concerning the organization of power in order to make it consistent with the democratic commitment you show in the organization of rights? Nothing, not only nothing, they, they did something that were worse than that. They strengthened the powers of the executive. So what happened in, in Ecuador was what could have expected. They included hundreds of indigenous rights, participatory rights, but every time, and I have been following the case, every time that the people or indigenous groups wanted to make those rights real, they received a veto from the president. And that's not something against Korea or uh, Chavez, etc. It's something about the logic of the Constitution. If you concentrate power, then it, it, it doesn't matter, or it's not so important if you democratize more and more the organization of rights. What we did in our Constitution since the Mexican uh, uh, Revolution is that we allowed, say, to put it metaphorically, we allowed the working class to get into the Constitution through the organization of rights. But we kept the organization of power closed. We kept the doors of the engine room closed. We didn't allow the working class to get into the organization of power. So that explains, that's a, a basic logical thing, or a, a thing that one could have expected from the very first minute. If you don't change in a particular way the organization of power, if you do not democratize the organization of power, what you're going to have is you're going to have those rights that are going to have enormous problems for becoming enforced rights. So that's something that you, you, you should have known. That so, so either this has to do with some hypocrisy or, or with bad knowledge, or you don't want to see what you're doing. So, so those constitutions, I praise, and for, so for, I, I, I read like some Europeans' uh, 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 articles about the constitutions, say, no, these are 
important lesson. What he said is, is something that we have not, not learned. He said, because we care so much about certain rights, the first thing we are going to do is not to fool the Constitution, to, to put more and more rights, property rights, contract rights in the Constitution. What we are going to do is to work in the organization of power. So because we care about rights, we work in the organization of power. That lesson, I think, we should learn and we haven't learned. And that's a very important lesson. The second lesson comes from, from this uh, former president of, of Colombia, Murillo Toro, who said, because I care so much about political reform, what we need is, uh, because we care about political reform, is that I propose a radical egalitarian economic reform. So what would, he said, what would universal suffrage mean in a society where the majority had no guaranteed subsistence? So again, I mean, this is an advice coming from <coughs> a quite radical political thinker in the 19th century. We care so much about uh, political equality, and that's why we, we understand that political reform need to go hand in hand with economic reform, but a particular economic reform, an egalitarian, a radical egalitarian economic reform, and ensuring the basic subsistence to all. So uh, I, I want to conclude with those